सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली If you ask people who are critical of Narendra Modi why he is a two-term prime minister and may well be a third-term prime minister you will usually get the same answer one word hindutva according to this view Mr Modi is prime minister and gets elected again and again continues to be popular and powerful because he's managed to persuade Hindus that they should vote as Hindus nobody they say has done this before and because of that he continues to hold on to power now i don't dispute that there's something to this explanation certainly one of Mr Modi's achievements has been to make Hindus feel that they are a minority and therefore they should vote to protect themselves nobody else has managed to do it and mr modi has done it so full credit for that but i don't think it's as simple as hindutva because if all you needed to do to win elections was to make hindus conscious of being hindus then the jansang would have come to power 40 years ago even today yogi adityanath would be more popular than mr modi sadvi pragya would be a significant figure so yes hindutva is part of the answer but it's not the whole answer Prashant Kishore who worked with Mr Modi before Mr Modi first came to power says that we forget when we talk about Hindutva that Mr Modi has other elements to his appeal according to Kishore the appeal is based on three things one of course he says is Hindutva but there are two others the second he says is welfareism Mr Modi does a lot of welfare there's a lot that people at the bottom of the pyramid get from him that is not often acknowledged and the third he says is nationalism when you offer this argument to critics of Mr Modi they say to you yeah yeah i know he does welfareism the congress started it he copied these schemes he expanded them yeah well maybe he did but nobody really argues too much about this because how can you argue the schemes are there It's the third one that people ignore. When you talk about Mr Modi's nationalism, they dismiss it. They say it's jingoism, it doesn't mean anything. They use bad terms for it. They call it so sort of national socialism. It's not actually those things. It's a much subtler approach and it's an approach that explains a lot of his popularity. Nor is it a particularly unusual approach. Think about it. When Putin came to power, what was he saying he said that the soviet union used to be a great world power it's now collapsed people are laughing at us i will take russia back to the forefront look at donald trump what was his slogan make america great again the same sort of appeal that america had fallen in public esteem that america was not strong america was not great he would make america great again now think back to the election the first election that mr modi won not the last election the one before that do we think of it all in terms of hindutva if you were to look at mr modi's speeches during that period he was very careful to say very little about hindu muslim relations his speech was basically this it was you are living in a scam ridden government it's full of scams it's full of scamsters for many decades one family and one party has ignored development india has got a raw deal elect me and i'll clean up the system there won't be any elites there won't be any scamsters there won't be any frauds instead there will be development india will become the sort of country people admire that was essentially his appeal and it's still the sort of appeal he uses in his speeches even now there's not much about muslims in his speeches in fact this nationalistic i will make india great again theme is something he's never actually deviated from to a large part i think that explains mr modi's success if you look at the last general election one reason why he did very well at the last general election was not hindutva it was balakot after the pulwana massacre he showed that he could retaliate successfully even now after the attack well, the invasion shall we say of 
Khalistanis at our High Commission in London. They have removed security from the British High Commission over here, and BJP spokespeople have been tweeting, "This is how we do it." Can you imagine the UPA doing it? Again, the suggestion is that they've made India great again. It's muscular. It's going to reply. In fact, it's not true because the UPA had a similar situation in the US and also removed security from the US embassy. But BJP spokespeople either don't know this or they imagine that everybody else has short memories. The point is, they go on with this kind of sloganeering. And Mr. Modi revels in it. When he started going abroad after becoming prime minister, every time there were gatherings of the diaspora, he would say to them, "Aren't you proud to be Indians again? Wasn't it terrible whenever you went and people talked about scams?" And he suggested to them that he'd restored Indian pride. If you talk also to BJP supporters and particularly sort of low-level supporters who are enthusiasts rather than office bearers, one theme will recur. It is that India is now respected. Before this, India was not respected. People have said to me, "You know, when you go abroad and people look at us, you can feel the respect they have for us. They never used to feel like that abroad. That, of course, is because of Mr. Modi." Okay, maybe it's true. It's not been my experience, but maybe it has been other people's experience. Every time anybody. Comes to head an international corporation, anybody of Indian origin, the first thing that will be suggested is that this is part of an Indian resurgence, a part of India becoming great again, and somehow it will be linked to what Mr. Modi has done. Take the G20 presidency now. This is a rotational thing. Everybody has a chance. It's not that we won a popular election to become president of the G20, but look at the way in which it's being projected. Look at the money that's being spent in India to brag about it. Again, it's part of that same theme that under Mr. Modi, India has become great again. India is respected on the world stage. It's a theme that plays well. And there's a secondary theme to it, not one that Mr. Modi himself used, but if you look at the two election campaigns, it appears again and again on social media and from his supporters. The suggestion there was that India was still in thrall to the people who'd colonized us, that we were still in thrall to white people. Anybody who said anything vaguely liberal was dismissed as a brown sepoy, and the battle was framed in terms of brown Indians. Versus white foreigners and Indians who were trying to be like white foreigners. It's a theme that appears throughout in all of the BJP's public utterances on social media. It was a convenient theme because they were able to use it to attack the Congress for obvious reasons. Now you could say that Sonia Gandhi is more Indian than she's Italian; that there's nothing particularly Italian about her, and she went out of her way, I think, to embrace her Indianness. So after a while, it sort of died down when it came to Sonia Gandhi. But Rahul Gandhi has walked into this trap. Every month, he would be abroad somewhere. He would seem fair, elitist, could pass off as an Italian, and the BJP, I think, hammered away at this theme. The suggestion was that he was a European who was happiest when he was. Being friendly with other Europeans in some European country, that he wasn't really Indian. When Rahul sort of proved this wrong, finally after years of falling into this BJP trap, by four and a half months of the Bharat Jodo Yatra, when he revealed he was as Indian as anybody else, he connected with people, ordinary people, on an everyday basis all along the route. I think the BJP knew it had a problem. So what did it do? It waited, and then Rahul went to London. He went to Cambridge, and he said pretty much the same sorts of things he says when he is in there about the threats to Indian democracy, the stifling of dissent, the problems in Parliament, the raids by enforcement agencies on anyone who holds a different kind of view. He said this before in India. He said it abroad, but they immediately. Took what were essentially attacks on Mr. Modi and claimed that they were attacks on India. Again, there was that same suggestion that this European is going off to his European friends and he's rubbishing us back in India. 
And when there wasn't enough substance in the allegation, they just made stuff up. For instance, they said that Rahul had gone abroad and asked foreign powers to intervene in India's affairs. If you go through his speeches, he never ever said anything remotely like that. Yet, such is the power of social media and appliant mainstream media that this idea has been firmly embedded in the eyes of many people and in the minds of many people. So that's this approach. The approach is that the Gandhis, who are basically Europeans, continued to steal from India just as people had stolen during the colonial era. India got nowhere. Mr. Modi came out of nowhere. He was an Indian. He had no advantages, but he managed to rise to the top. And he's made India respected all over the world. Urban sophisticates sneer at this. They point out what's wrong. And they say, this is not really nationalism. These are lies, etc. I'm not getting into that. The point is, it works. The point is that people believe this stuff. I'll give you an example from my own experience over the last month or so. I anchored a session at the ABP News Summit. The session was with Ashwini Vaishna, who's railway minister, telecom minister, and IT minister, who's probably one of the most competent, articulate, and charming ministers in this government. When he got up to speak, I think within three minutes, he had the audience eating out of the palm of his hand. He did a presentation which he showed what the railways had done. Stuff like the Vande Bharat Express, the way in which they were redoing railway stations to make them hubs and cities where people could meet, enjoy themselves. And every time he talked about it, he talked about the fact that this was world class. He went on to telecom and what they'd done. And he talked about how much the West had appreciated it, how much people said to him, nobody else in the world has done this. India is now ahead of the rest. He went on to IT. He made the same point. Throughout his speech, he was cheered. People clapped because they believed that this was India regaining its place at the top of the pyramid, India being treated as a world power in technology and in railways, India being treated as a country that the West looked up to because of what we'd achieved. There was another significant part to it, which is that almost every time he spoke about something, he managed to include the prime minister. For instance, he said, we did a two and a half hour presentation to the prime minister and we said, we're doing this with the railways. And he didn't say anything. And then he called me at night and he said, Ashwini, what you're doing is fine, but you're thinking a year ahead. I want an India where people think 50 years ahead. Cheers, clapping, rapturous applause from the audience. And even during the question and answer bit, which I was anchoring when I was talking to him, when I tried to compliment him on his achievements, because they are very real achievements, he refused to accept any of the compliments. He said this is because of Mr. Modi and because of Mr. Modi's vision. More cheers, more clapping from the audience. I don't think the Congress gets that. Many of the people sitting in that audience were educated, well, everybody in that audience was educated and middle class, but many of them were not people who were prejudiced or Hindutva lovers or committed to hating Muslims or whatever. They were just Indians who wanted to feel proud. And Mr. Modi and Mr. Vaishnav in this case gave them that, gave them a reason to feel proud, gave them a reason to feel that India was going places. I don't dispute what Rahul Gandhi is saying. He's a perfect right to say it. I don't say it's wrong even. All I'm saying is that Mr. Modi has awakened a national pride that the Congress never did. I mean, partly it's because of the nature of his government and the nature of liberal governments. Trump goes on and on about how he's made America great. Barack Obama, who did a lot for America, never once said America was down in the dumps. I've made it great. That's not the way in which liberal governments function or the way in which liberal statesmen speak. But that is the way in which people like Mr. Modi speak. And when it comes to a country like India, which is a new emerging middle class, which has demographic changes, which is young people who are entering the political system, they see a leader who's charismatic and who tells them India is now the envy of the world. They believe him. They like it. I think that's the problem the opposition is going to face up to. You can't keep going on and on about Hindutva. If you're going to oppose Mr. Modi effectively, you have to either puncture his achievements, which I don't think you can, or you have to also show that you're as nationalist as he is, that you've also done as much for India. So far, the opposition is not even thinking about it. But until it does, Mr. Modi is undefeatable.